It just takes a second for it to connect. A, a, a few Are seconds, apparently. It's it's uh, it's connecting currently. Just give it one second. Okay. Okay, there we go. All right, we are live. So you should see okay. that you got a notification says the content of this meeting is being sent to a third yes. party. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to the Howard County delegation meeting, our uh, first meeting of the session. I'm Delegate Jessica Feldmark, uh, Chair of the House Delegation, uh, together with Senator Clarence Lamb, who chairs the, the Senate delegation. Um, I will say we do not have a quorum on the Senate side this morning. So um, before we start off, we'll just clarify that we will not be voting <laughs> on, on any of the legislation this morning uh, since we don't have a, a quorum on the Senate side, but we will um, we will go ahead and um, have a discussion, give folks a chance to raise um, questions uh, so that hopefully we will be ready to vote on some of these items um, when we do have a quorum at a future meeting. Uh, Senator Lamb, did you wanna make any opening comments before we get started? Sure. Welcome, everyone. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay. Um, I do want to introduce uh, to the delegation and and our viewing audience, um, Tyler Babich, who is our uh, new delegation counsel from the Department of Legislative Services. Tyler, did you want to just introduce yourself briefly? Delegations or committees, and I'm looking forward to helping out and filling in while uh, Dara is on a different assignment for this session. For this session. Thank you. Okay, um, we will start with uh, Howard County 124. Uh, this is Senator Lamb's bill on public campaign financing for the Board of Education. Um, for each of the bills, as we discuss, I'll start by asking the sponsor. Um, maybe say a few words um, to, uh, to introduce the bill specifically on, um, on these first three bills. These are bills that we last year um, voted on either the same bill or a very similar version <laughs> of the bill. So um, if there are specific differences from last year's bill that the sponsor would like to highlight, um, that would be great uh, to include in your introduction also. Uh, so Senator Lamb. Sure. Thanks. So um, this bill, I think everyone pretty much remembers from before. Um, previously, we had um, years ago sponsored statewide legislation allow Board of Education candidates to um, uh, have public financing if their local jurisdiction decided to move forward with that. And uh, we couldn't get that passed. And so um, last year, we looked at just having a local bill um, which was passed by this delegation and was not passed by Ways and Means. And so um, this is the same bill coming forward again. Uh, I don't think there are any changes to this bill. It's basically enabling to um, Howard County government to set up public financing for Board of Education candidates, just like for um, council candidates and for um, the county executive. That's the bill. Any questions or discussion? All right. Well, you gave a very thorough uh, introduction there. <laughs> um, oh, I'm sorry. I do see hands. Uh, Delegate Terrassa. Yeah, two things. First, I wanted to um, welcome Tyler Babich, who I've worked with before, and I'm happy to see. Um, and Senator Lamb, I, my question is that I'm super glad you're doing this. This was a, um, a passion of mine when I was on um, the council passing that for the small election donor fund. Um, it, how does it, does it mirror that? Does it allow them to do the same thing as the, um, as the council? It's just enabling, is it pretty broad or, I'm sorry, I haven't looked back at it, but I'm assuming it it's is, broad enough. So they it can is enabling, it is, it is enabling. It's um, um, pretty much just allowing them to set it up for Board of Ed candidates. So if you look at the bill, it's mostly just changing, swapping the word county out for local elected of off, local elected office. So instead of county elected office- Oh, okay, excellent. The, okay, good. That's um, all. 
the the other slight yeah, variation in, the, in it the, the the one one thing that is different in it is that we did take out the um uh the um the provisions for the staggering and it's in a different bill so this one is just public financing on its own great thank you sure Okay, so I do want to also um, recognize that we have some members of our Board of Education here with us this morning um, to answer any questions that members of the delegation may have. Um, thank you all for being here um, as we discuss a number of bills that that deal with education and the school system, uh, and, and in this case, specifically the Board of Education. Um, so in general, we're we're asking you to be here to, to answer questions from the delegation, um, but I did see, uh, Dr. Chen, uh, you did have your, your hand raised. Was there a specific uh, comment or concern you had on this on this bill? Um, yeah, because of my first time, you know, to, to know the formatting, uh, because uh, when the Senator Lam uh, talked about the bill, I just want to know, you know, on the state level, we tried a similar bill. What's the reason we didn't pass? But you know, here are me. You know, we come here to answer your question. So, but it's optional. Thank you. Yeah. So your question is, why did the statewide bill not pass? Yes. What's the main reason? It's just a timing, just because of the. You know, I just want to give a more background if uh, if I could know. That's probably a good question for Ways and Means um, and the okay. chair of Ways and Means. So I don't have a good answer to that. I just know that we had, we had tried several times to pass statewide legislation enabling what basically this does at the local level, and it got stuck in Ways and Means. And so last year we had legislation that was very similar to basically this bill that was just a local bill that got stuck in Ways and Means. So I think okay. the answer lies in Ways and Means. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. I, can I also add that, if that's all right? That go ahead, go ahead Delegate Terrassa. Sorry about that. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, um, or chairs, I should say. Um, it, so it, it also a lot, sometimes the, the, the legislature looks to sort of doing one, just one, um, sorry, one jurisdiction rather than doing all of the jurisdictions at first. So, I think it's a good alternative to have, you know, let's try it in one jurisdiction. Although I would certainly love to see a statewide bill pass. We we I, had, um, I think either last year or I know this year coming forward, there's going to be another jurisdiction at least that's asking for this authority also. Um, I'm not sure that they'll be granted local courtesy just as we weren't granted last year, potentially will not be granted this year. Um, okay. But I think that's a question for leadership to understand what their reticence about um, public financing at the local level is. Um, as as folks know, I have uh, for the past couple of years had a, a a bill which would include board of education, but is actually broader um, to allow for expansion of public um, financing. Uh, to all state offices elected at the local level. Um, and that has not uh, been successful either. <laughs> um, I do think, uh, you know, in in conversations, um, you know, I think there is still um, from some a little bit of a perception that uh, the local uh, public campaign financing programs are still relatively new um, and sort of seeing how, uh, how things are going. Um, but you know, I'll I'll continue to push as I know Senator Lamb is as well. Um, any other questions on this bill? Okay, then let's move on to uh, Howard County six twenty four, um, which is uh, ranked choice voting and Board of Education elections. Uh, Delegate Wu. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And so this bill is actually the same as last year. I just want to really try to re-engage people who are not familiar with ranked choice voting, give a short introduction what ranked choice, rank choice voting means. It's really very straightforward. So voters have the option to rank candidates in order of preference 
like first, second, third, and so far, so so far, so forth. Vote like votes that do not help voters' top choices when count for the their next choices. So that means there was just no the vote will be maybe counted one, more than once. So ranked choice voting can eliminate problems like vote splitting. Sometimes people call that a spoiler candidates and the unpresentative outcome that can arise when more than two candidates run for a single position. That's the one reason we want to really start one school board candidate and a school board election because in general, there are so many candidates there and the ranked choice voting can help to prevent such smaller candidate situation. With the ranked choice voting, voter can really sincerely rank a candidate in order preference, right? Voter know if their first choice didn't win, their vote automatically count for their next choice instead. This, this mechanism for voters don't need to worry about how others will vote can help candidate and more likes to win. At the same time, as a candidate, they can compete without fear of splitting vote with like-minded individuals. So that means you really don't need to demean, like talk bad about other candidates, right? Just can promote yourself and present yourself truly to the voter. And so in this way, I would say it can discourage negative campaign. Candidates compete for second choice from their opponent supporters sometimes, right? Which means can lessen the incentive to run negative campaign. In this ranked choice voting contest, can they do best when they reach out positively to as many voters as possible, including those voters who do not support them at the first place, even their opponents and uh, supporters as well. So this bill presented exactly the same as last year. And uh, so we, we don't really get a favorable reporting from our delegation. And uh, there are initiatives in other counties as well to promote ranked choice voting for Montgomery County, for example. And so I really hope our delegation this time can report this favorably and give us a try. I'm welcoming any new questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Delegate Wu. Um, any questions, uh, Delegate Ziegler? Oh, you're on mute. Is this enabling legislation for Howard County? I've forgotten. Yes, this is enable Howard County uh, to enable the ranked choice voting for Board of Education election. Thank you. And then there will be a, we call it a campaign for ranked choice voting as well. So try, try to educate the voter how to run, run ranked choice voting because it's new. Some some people may feel it's complicated and they, they need a campaign, election campaign to help them understand and run this as well. It, I see a, this uh, Delegate Hill first. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, um, uh, Delegate Wu, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of this particularly for um, school board races, but I had one question. Uh, sometimes there are, or not sometimes, there are, there are differences in how the system of ranked choice voting deals with um, uh, exhausted ballots, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. my question is, is this, um, something that you would leave up since it's enabling legislation to the local jurisdiction to determine how exhausted ballots would be dealt with or incomplete listings. Again, in some cases, if you've got five candidates and someone only lists one and two, some systems throw those others out and they require that you list everyone and other systems say, you know, we'll just count for how many rounds you list people. Um, so is it deliberate that you're not addressing that because you're going to leave it up to the locals since this is enabling legislation to spell out how that would be handled. Yeah, Delegate here. thank you for that question. Yes, there's a little different variation in terms of ranks you're voting, right? So I want to leave that to the local jurisdiction, like Howard County. I think eventually they probably set up a commission to look at this and then to see how they actually can set up a ranked choice voting system for Howard County. 
right? So I want to say per, make a recommendation, then the, the county will implement that as intended from that commission or that task force. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Delegate Terrasa. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just back to Delegate Siegler's question. Um, it is and what Delegate Wu said, which is true, it's new, but just to be clear, they've been doing it in many places. So there's a lot of people who say it's confusing, but we have very solid examples across the country of places where they've done it. It's not complicated. So um, I just wanted to add that because while it's new in terms of our voters knowing about it, it's not new in terms of us knowing how to do it. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion on this bill? Okay, seeing none, we will move on to Howard County 1024, Delegate Terrassa. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think we've seen this bill a couple of times, so I don't need to explain what it does, um, but it is about transparency, about knowing where um, money comes from and where it's spent and basically um, giving voters the, educate, the the information they need to make educated decisions um, when they vote. So I just wanted to um, address a couple issues really quickly. I know we don't have, um, I know we're not voting today, but I just want to make sure that I mentioned the constitutional issue um, because I do appreciate us not wanting to pass something that we have concerns about. And I think some of the concern came from um, the attorney general's office statement that it was not clearly unconstitutional, which I think in layman's terms, not that any of our lame, us are laymen um, on this on, uh, legislation, but in layman's terms, it sort of sounds like, well, it's probably unconstitutional, but really that's pretty standard language they use whenever, you know, something touches a constitution and is, but is not something that they consider unconstitutional. It's not clearly unconstitutional. Um, and in fact, it's a pretty typical or not unusual, I should say, um, designation and very often or very usually um, they'll give that designation legislature will move forward with it. So anything, for example, that's test that touches on campaign finance or guns or even. Um, um, oh, I forget the name of that. Um, there's another one. Oh. Oh, somebody who's on um, ENT, tell me what Marvin Holmes always the bills that Marvin Holmes always does. My brain is uh, ground uh, rent. Ground rents. Thank you. I don't know why <laughs> that slipped my head. Um, but even ground rents, like they always give it that same designation. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, you know, another concern I heard was that CA was private entity, um, and that we shouldn't be regulating private entity like this. But first of all, we do regulate on my, our committee, <laughs> um, and I think um, I know um, others have been in that situation. We regulate HOAs all the time, but also what I would say is CA is really unique. It's not like a nonprofit. Donations to nonprofits are voluntary, um, whereas you have no choice of whether to pay your CA assessment other than to move, um, which is the same thing for your Howard County taxes. You have no choices about whether to pay your Howard County taxes, except to not live in Howard County. I mean, that's that's not really a choice. That's a, that's a mandatory assessment. Um, CAs also, it's it's really more like a corporate city. Um, it's huge. It's 41,000 households, 105,412 units, um, whereas the typical uh, HOA is somewhere between 20 and 300 units. Um, and I think a, we, a number of us have noted in, you know, in talking with folks that if Columbia were incorporated as the city, it would be the second largest city in Maryland, second only to Baltimore City. Um, Columbia Association has a $70 million budget. They have bonding authority. Um, and on many occasions, as my committee knows, CA has argued that Columbia should be exempted from legislation that applies to HOAs. And on multiple occasions, we have granted that exemption. Um, and they make a lot of important decisions. They execute liens, they manage open space. I'm just trying to skim through some of the things that I you know, wanted to mention. There's nearly 100 miles of pathways. They do um, also, they do parks, um, obviously, uh, just like a county would. And um, 
And one can argue in our case that it's also somewhat of a pipeline to the legislature, given that at least four of us, and I might be undercounting, but I think at least four of us have served NCA um, boards at, in some capacity. And it's not a high, you know, the problem's not a hypothetical one. We've seen money in CA elections, something that happened in 2021, as we know, um, whether you like it or not, whether you like the donors or not, it certainly was clear that a lot of money flowed into that election. So the final thing I wanted to say is there are two issues that have come up. Um, one is whether we want to exclude in terms of changes I might be looking to make. And if anybody has thoughts, I'm happy to, to take them. One is to exclude de minimis contributions. So possibly if you've given your neighbor $50 or less um, to run for a board, perhaps those don't need to be reported. That's just something to give some thought to. Um, and then the other one is independent expenditures. And so, um, as you might know, a couple of boards have sort of raised some, a couple of village boards have raised concerns. And I would say for the most part, the people who have raised those concerns are concerned that we're not going far enough with this legislation, that it doesn't touch on independent expenditures. And um, I'm supportive of that conceptually and have asked our attorney and the board of elections to take another look at that issue and see if they think we can do that here. Um, and I welcome your comments and I welcome your support. <laughs> Are there any, oh, Delegate Ziegler. I guess I, in my perfect world, and I'm certainly gonna support the legislation, um, I wish CA would do this themselves. You know, I, I, as yeah. a recognition of the fact that, you know, this is Maryland's uh, second largest city. And, um, you know, that we've obviously gotten to a point where those elections are are really meaningful. They're not just, you know, like running for dog catcher or something. Um, so I just wondered what what conversations you have had with the CA board, if any, about this. So and I really appreciate those those that thought. I mean, it would be ideal. And what I would say is that oftentimes, I don't think this is a case, but oftentimes if you have a board that where money has really been involved um, in a bad way, which is definitely not the case with this board, I'm not saying that at all about this board, but, you know, part of the problem is if people put money into influence folks, then it's hard to get those folks to want to have to report that same, those same influences. So I don't think that's necessarily true of this board, but I have in the past, I haven't in the last few months, I believe I did last summer, talked to most of the board members. I'm trying to think of who I've spoken with, but certainly most of the board members I've had some conversation over the years and I've talked to the CA um, current president about that. Um, but I mean, I think the issue is that money in politics um, is it is um can be really poisonous and so while i don't think we've had that circumstance yet i think the issue is just making sure that we know about what money is in politics so in the future we don't have to deal with that and i'm not sure i explained that very clearly um i don't have concerns about the, the people that are there i think they're all good people who want to serve our community but um i'm not sure that they're the ones who are going to do this um I'm not, I'm just not sure. Um, but, you know, it's a good conversation to have, and I may do that again, although I'm hoping we pass this, um, but it's certainly a conversation I can continue to have with folks. Thank you. Any other questions for Delegate Tarasa? Okay, seeing none, we will move on to Howard County 224. Um, this is uh, regarding Board of Education member terms and compensation, uh, Senator Lamb. Great, thank you. Um, there are two provisions to this bill, uh, one of which um, most of the, well, I guess all the delegation members have seen last year, which is kind of a re-staggering of the terms. The other one is creating a compensation commission to review and examine and provide recommendations on um, what the compensation for Board of Ed uh, members should be. Um, 
And that would be a recommendation to us and the council um, who would then have to enable that change. Um, for the board member terms, um, uh, I think the members of the delegation are familiar with this, um, but it's to allow for restaggering as you are probably all familiar as well. There are seven board members, two of which are voted at large in the same cycle. And then the other five are voted um, uh, by council manic districts in their own cycle. And, um, you know, and, and we've had testimony um, even just two months ago uh, that was supportive of the fact that, um, you know, the restaggering may be something we want to consider, you know, and, and, and they gave some reasons, for example. One, um, the um, if you if you look at the current composition of the board, um, if all of the five council manic based members were to come off in the next election cycle, the cumulative uh, experience on the board that would remain was three and a half years. Um, which is really, really low when you think about it. And the, the fact of the matter is that, you know, there are important budget decisions are made, there are other important decisions are made that really that experience could be important and helpful for. Um, and restaggering allows that to um, be better distributed if there were wholesale changes in board members um, as a result of some of these elections. It just allows for better distribution of um, the members. Um, so, um, you know, happy to to answer any further questions about it. I think um, there was a discussion on how you restagger it, and um, there are two ways to go about it. You either extend a term um, of some of the candidates that are running for one of the future elections, or you shorten a term for one of the for some of the candidates running for future elections. I think in discussions from last year, um, members of the delegation did not prefer to shorten a term to two years, nor to to have them staggered. So um, the preference was to lengthen some terms to um, achieve the restaggering. And that's what this bill does. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, Delegate Hill. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask Dr. Chen and, and Lou and um, Ms. Mallow um, in whatever order how they feel about this. And I'm also um, would ask uh, Chairman Lamb if he's um, given, has any comments or thoughts about the fact that uh, this year we um, have several councilmatic seats with no candidates, uh, although we're only in January. And there's, you know, whether he has comments about um, assertion that maybe we've done so much tinkering in the last you know, eight, eight years that um, voters are getting put off by the changes every couple of years in the board. So maybe the board members first. And I, I know that this is important stuff and I know Senator Lamb has a response for that. So. Dr. Chen. Yes, uh, I think I just want to share what I hear, what I observe. There's a couple of things first, it's the county district, the election, it's a fairly new. It's only go through one cycle. I think we do have some concern about the institute knowledge may lost, you know, because of five member they the, the, the possibility they all gone. But in the realistic, it's, uh, I think some of our members still can carry on. So in terms of the institution knowledge, the best way to keep that is we have a good you know, handbook and the administration to help the transition. That's uh, like uh, Delegate Hill talk about the like, county level council member. They do the five district at, at the same time. If the concern is to hold true for the school board, then it will be hold true for the county council as well. And also I heard from, from parents, from the teachers, it's a, uh, they have a concern about the six year term um, it's a reduce the voters' power, and uh, that's uh, I think that's one concern. Uh, the other thing is from the candidates. Uh, six year term is a difficult for a lot of uh, candidates um, because many things could happen. And in the six years, you know, the family member or you have a career change. Um, based on the current composition, um, school board really hard to support itself financially. And you need a 
spouse who are earn like enough money to support in, or you have a full time job to support. So six year will be even adding more difficult there. Um, so that's some of the concern um have, and uh, definitely I will add in on. And uh, Dr. Liu and uh, Ms. Mallow can add on as well. Thank you. Dr. Liu. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, so for the two parts of the bill, uh, we all support the compensation part. Um, about the term, actually, we have concerns because the law change was in 2018. Um, the change was too short. It may confuse the voters and also we want to wait until we see more data to see what's the impact. Because if the concern is about the institution knowledge, right now we don't really have that data yet. Because right now, um, we don't really know who will um, run for re-election because they haven't filed yet. So we want to wait, give us more time to observe and see how it worked out. Um, but in theory, I think in the, in the long run, four was a three split will be better than five was a two. However, uh, we don't think right now is the right timing. And also about other concerns, because we saw that in the uh, proposed bill talking about uh, whoever wins the highest percentage will get a longer term. However, that part actually partially impacted by the voter demographics, which means that in um, several districts, the candidate will have a higher chance to get the highest percentage across all the um, all the um, elected uh, members that could potentially discourage participation of the candidates from that district because right now actually we are liking candidates from certain subpopulation. If we make this term even longer and they know they have a higher chance being elected for six years, probably they got further discouraged. So that is my perspective. So I think um, I saw that um, Ms. Mallow also raised her hand. Ms. Mallow. Thank you, uh, Chair Feldmark. Um, I would say the position of the board is that we support the compensation uh, section of the bill and that we um, suggest amendments on the term of the bill and the amendments are basically removable. Um, while that's being said, there was a... Um, there was not a unanimous vote in committee and we are the three members of the committee. Um, it was, however, the position of the board was passed unanimously uh, as the whole, over, over the term of the whole um, bill being brought forward to us in, last week. Uh, in terms of my specific position, I actually am in favor of a three, four split uh, because as the longest serving board member at five and a half years, I do think this is moderately significant in having, in the loss of institutional knowledge. And I don't know that um, a handbook and or administrative assistance is really gonna get us over that hump. And I do think it is different than the role of the county council because they are not an executive or they are not governing an executive as the board is. So I do think there is a fundamental difference in the roles that those board members play. While it would be substantial change in the down ballot races, I do think that it might be worth the change. So, and I'm happy to answer any additional questions if committee members have them. And to answer uh, Delegate Hill's question as well, so um, yes, I think uh, this point's been brought up several times about how you get to the staggering, right? So, uh, and, and I'll talk about the rationale in a second, but how you get to it has to be either through terms that are extended or shortened, right? And we had this conversation last year about do members of this delegation prefer two-year terms to get us to staggering or some, 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 um, candidates running for board of ed having two-year terms to get us to the point of having them staggered 
or six year terms. And I think it was the members of the delegation that said we shouldn't cut these folks that are running for Board of Ed short for the same arguments that are coming forward now. People may not want to run because all of a sudden they're running for a two year term. Now we're hearing the same thing about people may not want to run because they don't want to run for a six year term. And so, you know, I'll defer to the delegation. We kind of threw it up to the delegation last year to say, what's the preference of the delegation? The preference of the delegation was for six-year terms. That's why we modified it last year to be this. That's why it's coming forward to be six-year terms again. Happy to go back to two-year terms if folks, if that's the preference of the delegation as well. So we open to that um, change. You know, I think the argument that this is um, maybe too soon or is tinkering and, you um, you know, we 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 have brought this um, uh, bill and legislation and the idea up several times, and we have not heard up to this point. Um, you know, I guess the the tinkering argument. I think it's 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 interesting because like the argument that this is too new is the same argument that public financing doesn't pass with. That um, you know, public financing is too new, and so we shouldn't extend it to board of ed candidates. So if you believe that public financing is too new to be extended to Board of Ed candidates, then you shouldn't vote for this either. Um, and so, you know, I think that's just something to think about. I think, you know, if we were to go back in time as to how this was set up for um, the council manic districts um, for the Board of Ed members, you know, I would have probably suggested, um, you know, staggering it back then and, and maybe making changes. And so while this is going back to, to try to modify things that we have put in place several years ago, um, that's what we as a legislature do, right? We recognize that issues have arisen and we're trying to solve a problem here. And while I recognize that we don't know who is going to be running in this coming election, you know, I don't think that that should preclude us from acting in the best interests of the board's composition writ large um, just because this coming election. And so I, I, I am not convinced that voter demographics um, and tinkering um, cause potential candidates to decide not to run. I think folks are not running for Board of Ed races because of the environment that we're in, where, um, you know, they're harassment of board members and they're, um, you know, concerned about personal attacks and the position has become more fraught. That's why people are not running for board of ed positions and potentially, which we've heard from a lot of um, board members and members of the public, the compensation piece, which is why the compensation commission um, is included as part of this. And so um, just wanted to, um, you know, answer Delegate Hill's question on, on those those pieces of it. May, may I follow up? Manager? Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask this to real quick. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to point out, and I think the sponsor would agree, um, that when people have terms, if family issues come up, they can always resign, right? And so being elected to a six-year term doesn't commit one to completing six years if there are reasons that that commitment proves excessive. Correct. Okay. Dr. Uh... Sorry, delegate. Woo. <laughs> yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Chair. So, Madam Chair, so I think I'm supporting the, the board about the compensation committee. That would be helpful. I, I think many other jurisdictions are actually doing the same. It's a big commitment for the school board member. So I think by looking to compensate at a prop at a better and a proper level, that definitely help. At the same time, last year I actually supported the, the term changes. Then through a lot of discussion later, I feel I think my position actually changed a little bit. I, I feel the way we do that is staggering. It's it's really I personally personally feel a little confusing. And uh, because we, we have a different districts as well, right? We have district, we have countywide, we have two-year term, we have four-year term. Sometimes a lot of voters actually get confused themselves. They, they really don't know, right? So in order to engage them, it really improve the voter turnout, I sometimes I feel 
the first straightforward and the simple solution actually is the best solution in terms of the district. And that's the reason I, I, I would really hope this bill can be split in two parts. One part about a compensation study, the other part about the, the term changes. That would be really helpful I will, in terms of the, like supporting this bill or not. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, in the interest of time, um, Dr. Liu, I'm gonna uh, move on right now. I, I actually have a question that um, is not regarding the the terms, which it sounds like is is uh, sort of the the more uh, substantive piece of debate right now. But um, Senator, I had a question. Just I want to make sure I understand your intended process is that the on the compensation side, the commission issues a report with recommendations to the council, and then the council in turn may. Um, adopt a resolution making recommendations to the delegation, and then the delegation in turn may adopt legislation um, uh, to change the, the compensation. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, I would like to request what I, I think is a friendly amendment on, and very minor, but when the commission issues their report, I'd I'd like to have that report actually issued to all of those entities, I think, as drafted. It just issues the report to the council. Um, so hopefully that's a hopefully that's a friendly amendment. <laughs> sure. I'm happy for us to get a copy of the report, too. OK, thank you. All right. Are there any other questions from delegation members on this bill? All right. Um, so I am going to not uh, start a new bill at this point because we all have to be on the floor in 15 minutes. Um, and I do want to just have a time for a couple of quick announcements. Um, I will say in the interest of um, time management and making sure we get through all of our uh, delegation legislation um, over the next few weeks before bills have to be um, dropped. I I hope if there is additional conversation on these issues, um, please reach out to Senator Lamb and, and other colleagues um, to continue to discuss um, offline uh, so that we can use our, our delegation meeting time um, as, as efficiently as possible. Um, I did want to announce uh, members, you already received this notice, but just for the public, um, the delegation will be holding a public hearing on statewide bills, as well as um, local bills that were filed late and therefore not part of our November public hearing. Um, that is coming up on Tuesday, January 30th at 7 p.m. It will be a virtual public hearing and um, the, the formal notice will be going out uh, today, but just wanted to announce that um, announce that now. Uh, we will be reconvening next week virtually uh, again at 9 a.m. on uh, Wednesday the 24th. So we will see you all then. Any, any final words of closing, uh, Senator Lamb? Uh, no, except to welcome Tyler. Uh, it's good to see you again. Welcome to the delegation. It's good to have you here. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all. We'll see you next week. Take care.